Welcome to Black History Matters 2022, presented by the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum, otherwise known as NAHOF, located in Peterborough, New York. Black History Matters is an educational series that seeks to highlight historical events in the Black American experience. Nahoff believes that by understanding history, we can better understand the present. This is one of a series of 28 videos that Nahoff will release daily throughout the month of February 2022. Videos are viewable on Nahoff's website. The mission of the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum is to honor anti-slavery abolitionists, their work to end slavery, and the legacy of that struggle, and strive to complete the second and ongoing abolition the Moral Conviction to End Racism. This program was funded in part by Humanities New York with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any view, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Milton C. Cernet. Dr. Cerna is Professor Emeritus of African American Studies and History at Syracuse University. He is a founding member of the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum and a member of the Cabinet of Freedom. Cernet's many publications include Abolitions Acts, Beriah Green, Oneida Institute, and the Black Freedom Struggle, North Star Country, Upstate New York and the Crusade for African American Freedom, and Harriet Tubman. Myth, Memory, and History. I'd like to now invite Dr. Cernet to begin his presentation. Thank you, and welcome. Today we're going to talk about education as liberation, focusing upon Briar Green, United Institute, and the Black Freedom Struggle. Frederick Douglass once said, True knowledge unfits a man to be a slave. And if you know a bit about Frederick Douglass's early life, he demonstrated that by learning to read and using his literate skills throughout his life for the cause of freedom. In the early 19th century, there were very few schools that African-Americans could attend and of course, if one was enslaved, it was illegal to be taught to read and write. However, the New York Manumission Society in the early 1800s started the African Free School in New York City. This is the second building. The first one uh, burned down. This one dates from about 1820. And a few African-Americans were able to attend that. But generally speaking, most uh, white Americans were opposed to the education of African Americans. And Prudus Crandall discovered this. She had a school up in Canterbury, Connecticut called Prudus Crandall's Female Boarding School. And she taught uh, young uh, uh, white girls, but she dared to admit an African American girl the town citizens were incensed by this and forced her school to close down. The Noyes Academy, which was chartered in 1834 by Samuel Noyes and other New Canaan citizens in New Hampshire, was the first upper level co-ed school in the US open to African Americans, opening in 1835. But angry citizens took teams of oxen and dragged the academy building away, forcing the school to close. Henry Highland Garnett, Alexander Cromwell, and Thomas Stipkins Sidney, African-American students attended, and they will later, after that school closed, hear that the Oneida Institute in upstate New York was now open to them, and they attended that. Here is an artist's rendition of how the mob, as it were, used teams of oxen and hauled that school away and destroyed it. So where could one go if one was an African-American student in the early 19th century? 
Well, one could go to the Oneida Institute as founder or president during his time when it was an abolitionist school was Briah Green, uh, born in uh, Connecticut, uh, dies in Whitesboro on May 4th, 1874, and is buried in the Grandview Cemetery overlooking Whitesboro. Now this is an image, a very rare daguerreotype of Green when he was much younger. He had become the president of the United Institute in 1833 and transforms it from a manual labor school, that is a school where students had to uh, earn their tuition and board and room by doing working on the farm and in the, in the shops. Green, by the way, had presided at the organization of the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1835 in Philadelphia. In the Souls of Black Folk, W. Burkhart Du Bois says, recalling uh, Green, only a crank and an abolitionist like Beriah Green would have dared in the mid 1830s to admit black youth to the Oneida Institute. And before Green comes to the upstate region of New York where the Oneida Institute was located, he had gone out to Hudson, Ohio to the Western Reserve College. Uh, it was called the Yale of the West. And their students got a hold of a paper published by William Lloyd Garrison in 1834, 1831, calling for the immediate uncompensated emancipation. That paper was the liberator. And this was a radical call for the abolitionists because it opposed the scheme that many or some prominent whites promoted, which was colonization, that is a removal of African-Americans, including free African-Americans um, back to Liberia in Africa. Now Green and the chapel at the Western Reserve College had preached four sermons in November and December of 1835 in which he argued that uh, Northerners, particularly white Northerners who were not abolitionists, were equally as guilty as Southerners with regard to slavery. This incensed the trustees and they forced Green out. So he comes then to upstate New York, to Whitesboro, which is just west of Utica along the Erie Canal. And it was in the heart of a region called the Burned Over District, where in the 1820s and 1830s, there were, there were a series of revivals, religious revivals. And that helped to spark uh, interest in social reform. The leader of those revivals was Charles Grandison Finney. Now, George Washington Gale was the founder of that Oneida Institute of Manual Labor, but he was not uh, much of a leader, at least from the viewpoint of the students. And so Green comes in the fall of 1833 to replace him and transforms that school into an abolitionist school. Now, this is the location of the Oneida Institute along the Erie Canal in Whitesboro. That summer before Green arrives, a number of the students, including the abolitionists or future abolitionists, Theodore Dwight Well, uh, formed the first abolitionist society uh, in New York State. And these students, particularly those who are of a mind with Theodore Dwight Well, and graduate will go on down to Cincinnati to Lane Theological Seminary, where again, they help to spread the message of abolitionism and are opposed by some of the faculty. And they go up and help found Oberlin College. So there are direct links between the United Institute and, and a number of important schools 
such as the Oberlin College and Knox College in Illinois and uh, Berea College in Kentucky that link to this New York story. Now, Green came as president, succeeding Gale, on two conditions. He must not be hindered in advancing the immediatist cause, that is, the call for immediate emancipation. And he must be able to admit students without restrictions as to race or color, which was a very radical notion in Green's day. There was no other school at the time that was doing this, a school that offered classes that were beyond a kind of primary level. Green School, during the 10 years that he was president, admitted more African-American students than any other institution of its day. And these African-American students came because like Douglas, they believed that education was liberation. Students hid freedom seekers on campus and became abolitionists, became evangelists for abolitionism. One of the most prominent students was Alexander Crummel, 1819 to 1898. He later became a very important Episcopalian clergyman. He was, as Du Bois would say, one of the talented tenth. He had an interest in African uh, missionary work. And he came because he had been uh, forced out of the school that Noyes Academy and spent, uh, as W. Burkhart Du Bois says in The Souls of Black Folk, in that famous chapter, The Faith of the Fathers, where he, Du Bois talks about meeting Crummel. Crummel was, by that time, was quite up in years, and Du Bois was a young scholar, and he says that Crummel told him that Cromwell has spent three years of perfect equality at the United Institute, education as liberation. Another person who attended the school, though I have not found evidence that he graduated was Jermaine Wesley Logan. Uh, Logan had a Sunday school in Utica, which was not far from uh, Whitesboro, where the United Institute was Logan, was located, and Logan went on to become very well known in the Syracuse area, where he had an African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church and was very prominent in underground railroad work. Here is a list of names, African American students at the United Institute. Now, some of these individuals, such as Henry Highland Garnett and Jermaine Logan and William G. Allen and others, Alexander Crummel, we have quite a bit of information on. Others are less well known. And the difficulty in determining the total number of African Americans who attended the United States Institute is that Brian Green had no interest in labeling students by race in the student directories. So one has to know a name and then know a bit more about that person before putting on, them on the list. But there were at least 14. There may have been more. There may have been one African-American female who attended. But we'll, we still have more research to do. Now, Josiah. B. Grinnell, who was a student at the United Institute under President Green's uh, tutelage, later went on out to Ohio, founded Grinnell College. In Grinnell's autobiography, he reflects on the nature of the United Institute when he was a student there in 1841. Grinnell writes that he found emancipators boys from Cuba mulattoes, a Spanish student from the island of Menorca, an Indian named Kunkapat, black men who had served as sailors or as city hackmen, 
also the purest Africans escaped from slavery. Sons of American radicals, Bible students scanning Hebrew verse with ease in the place of Latin odes, enthusiasts, plowboys and printers, also real students of elegant taste captured by the genius of President Green. So you can see what a fascinating mix of students that were at the United Institute under the inspiration of Beriah Green. However, not everyone in the Whitestown area was enamored with Beriah Green and his school and how he transformed it, that school into a abolitionist training ground. And foremost among them was the Reverend David Ogden, who was a supporter of the American Colonization Society and pastor of the prominent Presbyterian Church in Weisboro, that Green, the faculty at the United Institute and the students attended. The United Institute had received funding from the Presbyterians conferences or Presbytery. And so uh, there was a natural link between the students and the church. But Green preached a sermon in the church, Things for Northern Men to Do, a discourse delivered in 1836. And that incensed Ogden and the conservative trustees. And so there was a split in the congregation and Green and his supporters were forced out, causing the United Institute to lose a great deal of financial support. So in 1837, a year, by the way, when there was a financial panic, which also caused the school to lose support, Garrett Smith, the famous abolitionist from Peterborough, had been a uh, good supporter of the school and his financial situation worsened and he was not able to contribute as much as he generally had. Green writes in 1837, April 12th, the very vitals of humanity are concerned in this strife. If the yoke of the enslaved is broken, humanity will escape from the incubus by which she has been well nigh suffocated. She will breathe freely again. So Green saw education and abolitionism as a means of breaking the yoke of slavery. Here is Garrett Smith. We should know that Garrett Smith had tried a small school in Peterborough and that Peterborough Academy did attract a, a handful of African Americans and Garrett Smith had hoped that they could be trained there and then go to Africa as missionaries. But that school did not last long, so he turned his attention to supporting Beriah Green's school. In his last valedictory address, delivered November 1st, 1843, Green said, quote, we don't deny that we have been traduced, derided, opposed, we confess that we are called onion grubbers and the Negro school. Fashion has tossed up her pretty nose at us. The grim ecclesiastic as he passes by on the other side exclaims with a knowing air that will never do. Well, they're tarnished as onion grubbers because they worked in the fields on the farm associated with the school and of course they're called the Negro school and worse because they had admitted African Americans. And this is what the United Institute looked like at the time of its sale in 1844. On the left and the right are the dormitories. In the center is the chapel and the classrooms. It was sold to Whitestown Seminary, which was a free will Baptist school. Uh, these were wooden structures at the time it was sold. And at the, in the last days, uh, most of the students were gone because they couldn't afford anymore to run the school and Green and his family were living in one of the rooms and uh, it had come to a sad end. 
Of all my friends and acquaintances, James Gillespie Burney, uh, a well-known abolitionist who once ran as a Liberty Party candidate for president, himself a former slaveholder, but he had seen the light, says, of all my friends and acquaintances in the abolitionist ranks, and they certainly contain a great deal of talent, Brian Greene's arguments strike me as most forcible and convincing. And this is Whitestown Seminary. The buildings you see here that succeeded those of the Oneida Institute are not the buildings that were formerly on the grounds of the Institute, which were wooden and burned down. Now, if you go to Whitesboro today and you attempt to locate the site of where the Oneida Institute was, this is what you see, a funeral home in the front and a building in the back. When I first did research, I hoped that I could find evidence of the United Institute. I was many, many years younger. And I met a colleague, a friend from Hamilton College, and he had gone up inside that brick building. And he was convinced that he heard the voice of Henry Highland Garnett, who was a famous orator in his own right, and one of the students. And only recently have I learned that that building belonged to the Whitestown Seminary. So we have no physical reminder of the United Institute and its African-American students and the abolition students in general there, though the spirit of the Institute lived on in its graduates. When Green died, in 1874, John Greenleaf Whittier, also an abolitionist, wrote, Oak Knoll, fifth month, 10th day, 1874. I am pained to learn of the death of that noble man, Briar Green, how thick the cypress shadows fall, and how few are left of those whom I met at the Anti-Slavery Convention of 1833. The world never knew that is understood Briar Greene. He was a great man morally and intellectually. He has died as he would have wished to die, lifting up his voice for God and humanity. Green, by the way, died in Whitesboro at the town hall when he was delivering a speech against the granting of licenses for another liquor establishment. So where to find some memory of Briar Green in Whitesboro? Well, you can go up to the cemetery overlooking Whitesboro and there is the monument to Briar Green. Yours truly when, again, I was much younger and our son Matt who I dragged around on these history excursions. Brad Green is now in the Oneida History Center Hall of Fame. And he has been inducted into the National Abolitionist Hall of Fame, which is in Peterborough. Born in Prescott, Connecticut, March 21st, 1795, died in Whitesboro, May 4th, 1874. The quote on the tombstone, he that doeth righteousness is righteous, is, is from the Hebrew scriptures. And indeed it sums up Brad Green's life and how he sought to inculcate in his students, black and white, that doing righteousness is a means of liberation. The book that this presentation is in part based upon is my book, Brad Green, an Idea Student in the Black Freedom Struggle, published by Syracuse University Press. As a codicil to this, we might say this. The notion that education's liberation is one that has been much contested in American history. Some of you may know about the um, Plessy versus Ferguson decision in 1896, in which uh, it was the 
declared by the Supreme Court that racial segregation in our public schools in the United States, as long as it was uh, separate but equal, was legal. Of course, it was rarely separate, rarely separate and equal. And African Americans historically have suffered in the United States from unequal educational opportunity. Plessy versus Ferguson then was overturned in 1954 and that famous case, Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. So while the separate but equal doctrine no longer stands as law, there are still educational challenges for African-Americans and a good model may be how some of these people like Henry Hatton Garnett and Alexander Cromwell and Jermaine Logan uh, saw education as a means of liberation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cernet, for your contribution of this presentation. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, Nehoff has provided a reference list of sources to learn more about the topic. This reference list is located in the video description box. Please help us by completing a brief survey available at the link on your screen and also in the video description. Feedback will help Nehoff receive funding and help plan future projects. Additionally, please contact Nehoff with any questions and if you are interested in learning more about the organization and its work. Once again, thank you Dr. Cernet for donating your time and contributing to this program. And thank you, the audience, for joining us on this educational journey, Black History Matters. We hope to see you at our next presentation.